In today's lecture, the first thing we're going to look at are some properties of solutions that we refer to as colligative properties. Now, colligative properties are properties of solution that are dependent upon the number of dissolved particles. And it doesn't depend upon the type of particle, just the number of particles. In other words, in this chapter we talked about that when materials dissolve, they may go in e as either ions or molecules. And if they go in as ions, for instance, for each sodium chloride unit, we would actually put in two particles, a sodium particle and a chloride particle. If we're putting in sugar, then each unit, each chemical formula unit goes in as one molecule. So we would get twice as many particles per mole of sodium chloride as we do per mole of sugar because we get two ions per unit. And that's what a colligative property is. It's dependent upon the number of particles, not the type of particle that's dissolved. Now, three properties that we look at relative to colligative properties then are boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure. What we find when we add a solute to a solvent, it affects those physical properties that we have up here. In other words, when I add a solute to water, it affects its freezing point. It affects the boiling point of the water. So the solution does not have the same freezing point and boiling point that the pure solvent does. Whenever we add a solute to a solvent, it results in the boiling point being elevated it means that the solution is going to boil at a higher temperature than the pure solvent and it lowers the freezing point. A solution will freeze at a lower temperature than does the pure solvent. And then osmotic pressure we'll come back and talk just a little bit more about here in just a minute. A couple of places that we apply this principle of freezing point depression and boiling point elevation. One is in the chemical that we put into our automobile radiator, which is referred to as, as you see on the label here, antifreeze coolant. All right, the reason that we put it in, of course, is by adding this chemical, which is ethylene glycol chemical that we mentioned the other day, a double alcohol, a polyalcohol. Ethylene glycol to water, it lowers the freezing point and that protects our automobile then from freezing when the temperature goes below normal zero Celsius degrees so that we're safe. As a matter of fact, of course, the label here shows it printed in Fahrenheit, not in Celsius, but we see it shows that we could protect our automobile by using the, the uh, antifreeze to a negative 84 Fahrenheit degrees, which would be down around minus 50 Celsius degrees. On the other end, notice that it also shows a temperature higher than normal boiling. Normal boiling is 212 Fahrenheit, but it shows that if we had this particular engine coolant added, it raises the boiling point to 256 degrees. What use is that? Well, number one is the warmer that the engine runs, the higher temperature it operates, the more efficient it is. So if we can operate an automobile engine at a higher temperature, we get better use of the gasoline that we're burning in it. But there's always the danger then if we operate at a high temperature, then whenever the engine is turned off, there's enough temperature there to begin boiling and we boil out all the engine coolant. So we need to make sure that we have a temperature higher than just normal boiling. 
Well, the addition of then the chemical shows us that the boiling point has now been raised from 212 to 250 or 76, and it has been lowered from 32 Fahrenheit, normal freezing, to minus 84 Fahrenheit. So we see that there's a, a fairly large change in the boiling and freezing point by using this so-called engine coolant, all right, or antifreeze. Well, that's one place that we see this aspect of freezing point, depression, and boiling point elevation. Another is if in the um, winter time you happen to be watching the news and you hear about cold weather reaching uh, Florida, oftentimes then they begin being concerned about uh, the crops freezing. That's a little bit larger than it needs to be, I guess. But that's a lemon there covered with water. Now, one of the things that they do to prevent the crop from itself being damaged is they spray water. If you've ever seen the weather for or weather uh, or news pictures when a freeze is in, let's say, the Orlando, Florida area, you'll notice that they have the sprinklers going and they spray water. The reason they do this is because water itself the water out of the faucet would freeze probably at about zero Celsius degrees. The fruit, of course, contains a solution. The chemical in the, the orange or the uh, uh, grapefruit or lemon or whatever it might be, of course, has sugar in it, has citric acid in it, has a lower freezing point. By spraying it with water, the pure water freezes. And actually, the, the lemon, the orange, the grapefruit can be totally coated with a layer of ice without causing any damage to the fruit itself. As long as the temperature doesn't go much below about 28 uh, uh, Fahrenheit degrees, a couple of degrees uh, minus in the Celsius, as long as it doesn't go below that, even though the water freezes on the fruit, it doesn't damage the fruit itself. But Keep in mind, we've talked about physical and chemical change in energy. When water goes from a liquid state to a solid state, that is an exothermic process. Energy must be lost by the water. Where does that heat energy go when that water freezes on the inside or outside of that fruit? It goes to warm the fruit itself. It helps maintain the temperature of the fruit, so the fruit really isn't even going to go below temperature of about zero Celsius degrees. So we use the, the idea that the freezing point of the solutions in the fruit has been lowered because of the solute present, and therefore we can use the pure water and let it freeze on the outside and prevent damage then from the fruit itself. So it uh, can be used there as well. In the summertime, uh, one of the nice treats that we sometimes have is, or we have a picnic, we make uh, homemade ice cream. And uh, to make homemade ice cream, of course, we have to use the idea of freezing point depression. If we were just to put the mix into the inside can in an ice cream maker, and put ice around it. We'd crank all day and never have ice cream. We would have a cold solution. We would have a cold milk solution with the flavoring in it, but it would never solidify. Because the solution making up ice cream has a lot of dissolved. We've already put a lot of solute in there, so that has lowered the freezing point of the ice cream mix. So if we're going to get it to become a solid, we must have something outside colder than that. Well, the way we do that is if we add salt, table salt, rock salt, to the ice on the outside, this lowers the freezing point of the ice, and we now can get the temperature outside low enough that we can begin to solidify the solution inside. Of course, we use this same principle in wintertime for clearing streets. We add salt to the street so that the salt lowers the freezing point so that the water that would normally be frozen at zero Celsius degrees will be a liquid at that same point. 
As it melts, we make a solution of salt and water, and of course that keeps lowering the freezing point. And we can, of course, do that down to a, 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 a maximum. We can't do it in very, very, very cold weather. But for normal winter conditions, that can be used. So again, there's an application of freezing point depression. Now, as I mentioned, osmotic pressure is also a colligative property. And what do we mean by osmotic pressure? What is it? If we were to take and set up a solution in a container, and in between the solution and the solvent water, we were to put what we call a semi-permeable membrane right there. Now a semi-permeable membrane is then a substance which will allow one material to pass through it but not another. And the semi-permeable membrane is usually then permeable to the water molecules. It means the water molecules can move through, but the dissolved molecules cannot. So if we were to put these two together, we have a solution on this side and pure solvent on this side, what we find is that the water will try to move through the semi-permeable membrane to produce the same concentration of solution on both sides. And it will continue to do that until gravity affects it in such a way that it can no longer do so. Notice here that if we were to come back sometime later, we see that the solution has greatly increased and the water has greatly decreased. Now that would spontaneously occur. And in order to prevent it from occurring, we would have to apply some pressure to that system. And this is what we mean by the osmotic pressure. It's the amount of pressure that we would have to apply to the solution side to prevent the water molecules from transferring across that semi-permeable membrane. That's how we measure osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure accounts for plants' ability to transport water from the root system to the leaves. In the leaves, we have photosynthesis occurring. Sugar is being produced. And that means the sugar that's in the leaf is in solution. And of course, then, between that leaf and the roots, we then have a difference in concentration of the water in the soil and the solution in the leaf. And the water then by osmotic pressure, by osmosis, is moving from the root tissue up to the leaf to dilute it. Now, different plants have different cell tissue, different cell structures. And so the amount or the height that water can be transported is dependent upon the structure of the plant itself. A plant can only grow as tall as it can actually transport water. If you can't transport water, you can no longer have growth. And so a redwood tree in California, for instance, which grows several hundred feet in height, versus a shrub in an area that might be like uh, Arizona, a scrub tree that may only grow eight feet tall, it's because of the transportability, the osmosis ability then of the plants, the plant difference. It didn't make any difference if we took that shrub and moved it over to California, it still wouldn't grow more than eight feet because its cell structure is built in such a way that that's as far as it's going to be able to transport the water. So we have some limitations on the height. Now, this is one, or, or actually by applying this principle, we can reverse the process and talk about then reverse osmosis. And reverse osmosis means that what we're going to do is we're going to apply a pressure greater than the osmotic pressure. Okay, 
So we're going to take that piston over here. We're going to push on it now hard enough that we've actually exceeded the pressure that the solution would normally have. That's called reverse osmosis. And we can use reverse osmosis then. We can put salt solution, seawater, in this side. We can push on the piston and we can literally squeeze the solvent molecules, the water, to this side. And so this is one of the ways, of course, that we can produce drinkable water supplies in areas that we have salt water or brackish water where we couldn't do it in any other reasonable fashion. We can do it by reverse osmosis. But it's expensive. It takes energy to run the pumps, the pistons that put the pressure. It costs money to build the semi-permeable membranes that allow the water to pass. And so preparing water for drinking by reverse osmosis is not an inexpensive process. So it may cost you a dollar a gallon or so for the drinking water that's produced. In other words, you don't use this type of water, of course, for showering and bathing. You use it for drinking purposes. The other ways we can get pure water, of course, is by distillation, by boiling it and recondensing uh, then the pure water as it comes off from the solution. But that's energy costly, and so that costs money as well. All right. Now, as a matter of fact, one of the... Uh, uses of reverse osmosis is in life raft or, or uh, safety material or aircraft where you have pilots that may be flying over uh, large bodies of water. One of the things that they carry with them is a little reverse osmosis pump. What we see depicted here, not very clearly, but the uh, picture is also in the text, uh, we see the pump right here and the handle up here and this individual now this would be dipped down into the ocean water for instance and the ocean water then comes up in and it is being pressurized by the pump and we see the other individual over here then drinking the pure water that is coming out of the reverse osmosis. So in emergency kits, in aircraft, military aircraft, especially that fly over uh, ocean and seawater areas, they carry this type of pump. Because if you drink salt water, what happens is that you then have put salt water on the outside of the cell, which has a higher concentration than the solution inside of the cells. And what happens is the water in your body then moves across to dilute the salt water, which means that you're losing water from your cells faster when you drink salt water than if you don't drink water at all. And so the danger is any time one was in a salt water condition, the last thing they'd want to do would be drink any because that merely speeds up the dehydration process because that's going to be more concentrated than the water in the cells that it's in contact with causing dehydration. All right. Also in the medical area, one of the things that we have to be concerned with if we are going to collect blood samples and store them is that the solution that we store the red blood cells in have the same osmotic pressure as the normal cell fluid. In other words, we can spin down and collect primarily red blood cells and store them instead of bulk uh, uh, blood. But if we do that, those red blood cells have to be stored in a proper solution, one which has the same or nearly the same osmotic pressure as normal uh, cell fluids would. If you took normal red blood cells and put them into water, what you find is they'll just enlarge. They'll, they'll keep inflating because of the concentration internally. They'll pull in water and they'll rupture. Or if we take the red blood cell and put it into a salty solution, they'll dehydrate and, and collapse. So we must have the same or very nearly the same concentration osmotic pressure wise uh, internal and external for the red blood cells to be stored. And when we have solutions that have similar osmotic pressure, 
we refer to them as isotonic. Another place where this goes in, if we're putting in intravenous fluids, for instance, into the body, sugar solutions during an operation, something like that. The solution going into the body must have very nearly the same osmotic pressure as the fluid it's going into. If not, this is going to result in a dehydration process or an uptake of water either way, and the problem will then result in discomfort. People that have, for instance, uh, injections of various dyes for, let's say, uh, x-ray studies, uh, sometimes have a burning sensation from the fluid that's injected. And part of this is because of the none isotonic relationship between the solution we're injecting and the solution that it's going into. It doesn't take much. If we upset the, the uh, uh, movement of water, we upset the calcium ion movement, sodium ion movement, all of those things can create then discomfort in human cells. Isotonic, the same osmotic pressure. Now, <clears throat> We said that these three properties are dependent upon the number of dissolved particles. And yes, these all have quantitative relationships that we can deal with. The two that we're going to look at here are the freezing point change and the boiling point change of solutions. There's a quantitative one also for the calculating of osmotic pressure. We're not going to deal with that in this chapter. These two equations, the change in freezing point of a solvent is equal to the concentration of the solution expressed in units of molality, and we'll define that in a second, times a freezing point depression constant, which is dependent upon the solvent. It's the solvent's freezing point constant. Or the boiling point is elevated, the change in the boiling point then is equal to this molality times the boiling point elevation constant. Now, molality, we need to define that concentration unit. This is not one that we have dealt with before. We talked about percent by mass, percent by volume, and molarity. Molarity is moles of solute per liter of solution. All right? Molality, lowercase m instead of uppercase m as we had in molarity. Molality is defined as the moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. Notice that this is the only concentration unit that we've talked about, that the bottom term is not solution. Here, we're dealing with solvent. Not only that, this is mass of solvent, not volume of solvent. So this is molality, and those are the concentration units that we need if we're quantitatively going to determine the change in boiling point or freezing point of a solution. Let's take a look, first of all, then, at calculating the molality of a solution. And so the first example I have to look at here is calculate the molality of a solution if we dissolve 37.9 grams of C6H10 in 375 grams of methanol. Now once again, keeping in mind what we define the molality as, we said molality is moles, so in this particular case that'll be moles of C6H10O over kilograms of solvent, and the solvent in this particular case is methanol. And it really doesn't, see we don't even need the chemical formula. It's just the mass of the solvent, whatever it happens to be. So it would be the same if we used 375 grams of water or 375 grams of carbon tetrachloride because it's just merely kilograms of solvent. 
so it doesn't make any difference what the solvent is. So in this particular case then we're going to be looking at this as our solute and this is our solvent and of course by definition we said that the solute was the chemical in the lesser amount, 37.9, and the solvent is the component in the greatest amount, the methanol. So molality would be equal to 37.9 grams of C6H10O over 375 grams and we really don't even need to say anything about what it is. Now we see that to get from where we are to where we want to be we need to change the top term from grams to moles and we need to change the bottom term from grams to kilograms. And so we can quickly do that then multiplied by 10 to the third grams per one kilogram and that will take care of the first conversion. But now we must change from grams to moles. So multiplied by one mole of C6H10O per number of grams. And we'd have to calculate it. Let's see. So we'd have 6 times 12.01, so that would be 72.06, 10 hydrogens, 10.10, and one oxygen, 16, and we would have 98.16 grams for a mole. So now we're at moles of C6H10O over kilograms of solvent, and that would be molality. And so let's see what we would end up with here for that. We have uh, 37.9 divided by 375 uh, times 1,000 and divided by 98.16. And so we would have then a molality of 1.03 molal solution. Any question on any step of that one? All right, let's apply it now to a colligative property, to a change. And so this time we're going to ask the question, calculate the freezing point if we were to dissolve 25 grams of sodium chloride in 500 grams of water, what will the freezing point be? Now we know the freezing point of pure water is zero Celsius degrees. So we want to know what is the new freezing point. Now we also know, all right, we also know that the freezing point will be lowered. So we know that our answer needs to come out less than zero when we get done. Now let's think what we have mentioned here. We've mentioned that delta T of freezing is equal to then the molality of the solution times the freezing point depression constant for the solvent, which in this case would be for water. So we need two pieces of information to calculate the change in the freezing point. That's what delta means, change in. So we want to calculate the change in the freezing point. We're going to need to do this and th this for information. Well, let's start first of all, M. We know how to do molality. We just did one. So molality would be 25.0 grams of sodium chloride divided by 0 0.5000 kilograms. <clears throat> I just went ahead without putting in the metric conversion, converted it just right away to kilograms. Multiplied by one mole of NaCl per number of grams of NaCl. And let's see, we would have 22.99 for the sodium, and we're going to add to that then, looking at the chart, 35.45 for the chlorine, we have 58.44 grams, and now then we're ready to calculate. So let's see here. And 
and I think, hopefully I've hit all the buttons right, 0 0.856 molal. All right, so that's the molality, so we have that. Now, where are we going to find the KF? Well, in the text, we find that we do have a table which has the KF and KB values for different solvents. And so if I look at that, I find that for water, because it lists the different solvents, for water, the KF is equal to 1.86. Celsius degree kilogram solvent over mole solute. Or if we look at this units right here, that is what? One over molality. That's just the units moles of solute over kilograms is molality, so this is the reverse units. Obviously, the reason that the units are that way is because if we're going to use KF, it must cancel the units that we would have had in molality. And seeing they're moles over kilogram, this has to be kilograms over moles, so our units work out correctly. Now we've got the two pieces of information that we need. We can go the next step, which is calculate delta T the change in the freezing point. So the change in the freezing point is 0 0.856. I'll go ahead and put the units back in. Moles of solute, kilogram solvent, okay, that's still molality, times KF, 1.86 Celsius degree, dot kilogram solvent over mole solute. And I just did that so that we see that mole solute does cancel, kilogram solvent does cancel, and the only units that we have left in the problem is Celsius degrees. So if we now were to multiply that out, so multiplied by 1.86, we have that delta T is equal to 1.59 Celsius degrees. Now we need to be careful, we didn't answer the question yet because it didn't ask us just to calculate the change in the freezing point, it asked us to calculate the freezing point. Normal freezing point is zero Celsius degrees. Freezing points are depressed. So therefore, the freezing point is equal to zero Celsius degree minus 1.59 Celsius degree, or in other words, the new freezing point is a negative 1.59 Celsius degrees. Now, if we were calculating boiling point elevation, we would go through the same process except when we got right here, the boiling point would have been 100 Celsius degrees plus the delta T for the system, okay? Any questions on any steps of that one? Yes, question. What page is that table on? Uh, page 126, okay. All right. Let's take a look at a further application of the concept of freezing point depression. When we were talking about determining the chemical formulas for compounds, we said that if we know the percent composition, we can determine the empirical formula. But to know what the actual molecule is, the actual molecular formula, we had to have one other piece of information, and that was to calculate, or we needed to know, the molar mass. Because the empirical formula is merely the smallest whole number ratio. It's not how the molecule actually might be. So we need an additional piece of information, the molar mass. And at that time, we said, well, how do we go about experimentally determining this molar mass? 
and I indicated that we would look at a couple of ways that this can be done as we go through later chapters. Here's the first one. One of the ways that we can determine the molar mass of a compound is to add a known amount of it to a known amount of solvent and measure the change in the freezing point. From that we can calculate molality. Remember molality has a term in there, mole, so we can calculate the number of moles and we know how many grams we put in. And what is molar mass? Grams per mole. So we have experimentally now a way in which we can determine the molar mass. All right, so again let's first of all jot down here the things that we need to find out. Molar mass is grams over moles of the solid. In this case, that will be x because that's, we don't know what it is. The grams of x over the number of moles of x. Well, we already have the grams of x. You see we have 6.35 grams of x. So somehow, I need to be able to find the moles of x. Well, let's remember what else we have. We know that delta t of freezing is equal to molality, which is moles of x over kilograms of solvent times Kf for the solvent. So we also know from up here what the freezing point is. If we know what the freezing point is, we can calculate delta T, the change. In other words, if we look up what it was before we added the chemical, this is what it was after we added the chemical, the difference would allow us to calculate delta T. Well, if we know that, if we can determine delta T, we know how many kilograms of solvent, we can look up the Kf, the only thing we don't have known in our problem is the moles of X. And so we can go ahead and solve for moles of X. Let's first of all calculate what delta T is. Delta Tf is equal to. All right, we would have to know what the freezing point of pure cyclohexane was first of all. Again, we would refer to our table of values. We find that for cyclohexane, the freezing point is uh, 6.5 Celsius degrees. The freezing point of the solution obviously is lower because freezing points would be lowered. Minus the 3.8 Celsius degrees means that we lowered the freezing point 2.7 Celsius degrees. So notice now we have this determined, we have this given in the problem and we can look this one up in the table. And so all we're going to have left to solve for is the moles of x. Once we've solved for that, we can substitute back up here and we can determine the molar mass. So this is an experimental way of now determining molar mass. Well, let's go ahead then and we'll, we'll plug everything in that we have up here. I suppose maybe we should go ahead and rearrange it algebraically at this point. That might be the best before we plug any numbers in. I want to solve for this by itself. And so I'm going to end up with mole of x equals delta Tf times kilograms of solvent divided by Kf. So by algebraically rearranging then, now we have put the thing that we want to solve for, the only thing we don't know in the problem at this point, on the side by itself. Now we'll plug in the values. Delta Tf was 2.7 Celsius degree. Kilograms of solvent, all right, we need to move back up here to get the number, 175 grams or in other words, 0 0.175 kilograms of solvent all over this Kf for cyclohexane. So we'd have to look on the table for cyclohexane and we find that it's a 
0.2 Celsius degree kilogram per mole. Now, if we look at our units, we will see that kilograms will cancel kilograms. Celsius degree cancels Celsius degree. We're going to be left with one over moles in the bottom term, which of course will give us units of moles, which is what we wanted. So at this point then we need to take 2.7 divided by 20.2 and multiplied by 0.175. And our answer is 0. 0234 moles of solid, moles of X. From that, we're now ready to go back to our equation up here at the top and now plug in 0 0.0234 moles of X and now we're going to have grams per mole which is molar mass. And I guess I better cut this off here. So, so that's equal to. So now we're going to take divide by 6.35. And we have a molar mass, 271 grams per mole as the molar mass of this chemical compound. So this is one of the methods that we can use to determine the molar mass of a chemical compound. If it will dissolve in one of these many solvents that we have, we can measure the freezing point depression. You might say, well, could you do it by measuring boiling point elevation? And the answer is yes, you could. The reason that we use the freezing point depression is if you look at the magnitude of Kf versus the magnitude of Kb for a solvent, you'll notice that the Kf is always a larger number than the Kb. In other words, the freezing point is lowered more per mole than the, free, than the boiling point is elevated per mole. Okay? If we go back to uh, the engine coolant, just to give an example of that, engine coolant, we were, before we add it, zero, or I guess we need to go with Fahrenheit here, 32F and 212F, that's for the water. The engine coolant range shows what? Minus 84 or something like that. And up on the upper end, we had 276. Now, this adding the same amount of the engine antifreeze coolant has lowered the freezing point 116 F degrees. That's delta T for the freezing. Delta T for the boiling is equal to 64 Fahrenheit degrees. We've added the same amount, but notice that the freezing point was lowered one and a half times, a little, even a little more than that, about one and, and uh, seven tenths times greater than what the boiling point was elevated. If you look at those numbers, then for KBs and KFs, you find this is true of most all of them. For instance, for the uh, cyclohexane that we just looked at, KB is equal to 2.79 Celsius degree per molale. Kf is 20.2 Celsius degree per molale. So we see that it's almost 10 times, 8 times greater effect on freezing than it is on boiling. And this is why then we use by choice measuring freezing point change rather than boiling point elevation. Now, before I leave this, is, are there any questions on any step that we did here? Yes, question. The, the 6.5, the question was, where did the 6.5 Celsius degrees come from? 
that's off that same table which gives the boiling points and freezing points of each solvent. So not only do we have the K values, but of course we have the, the uh, boiling and freezing points as well. Any other questions on any step of this here? Okay. Now in our discussion the other day, <clears throat> in which we were talking about the uh, brewing industry, one of the things that we have to monitor in brewing is the alcohol content in the brewing process. And this is done by measuring what we call the specific gravity of the fermentation, the brew, that is setting in the fermentation vessels. So we have then a way to measure specific gravity. Specific gravity by definition is the density of the unknown solution divided by the density of the water. Density of water, by the way, is one gram per milliliter. Okay? So if the density of an unknown was one gram per milliliter, obviously then the specific gravity would be one. Specific gravity is a unitless number. It's just a number. One, 1.1, 1 .1, 0.8. If something was 0.8, it would mean that it's less dense than water. The measuring device that we use to measure specific gravity is referred to as a hydrometer. And a hydrometer then contains a little ball or glass part. And this, I'm sure, is not going to project real well, not too badly. This is the hydrometer that you see right here. It has some weights down in the end of this glass ball, and it settles down in, and it's calibrated then using water. So right up here, it's marked with a 1. So that is floating at that level then in water which has a density of one. If I put it into a material which has a density greater than one, like the antifreeze in the automobile engine, then we see that it now is floating with the one, which is up here, sticking out. And so we're up about one point, uh, let's see, 1.1, 1 .1, 2, 3, 1.4 would be then the specific gravity of the solution in the antifreeze. In other words, the density of the solution is greater than the density of the water, so we would have the biggest number on top over one, and the specific gravity is then greater than one. In the brewing industry, however, as alcohol is produced during the fermentation process, the density decreases. And so what we have then is the tank sitting here as a, like a brewing tank with the fermentation going on. And in here then they have a hydrometer set. And by monitoring the height that the hydrometer is moving up and down, they can determine the amount of alcohol that is present. Alcohol is less dense than water, and so as the, the alcohol is, is formed from the sugars in the uh, brewing mix, then its density decreases. When the correct density is reached, the percent alcohol they want has been obtained, and of course the, the fermentation process can then be stopped. Well, in our next lecture, we'll uh, begin We'll, we'll, we'll spend just a moment or two talking a little bit more about wine, but then we'll go on and begin chapter five, which deals with another type of solution, which we call acids and bases. In chapter two, we talked about the organic compounds called hydrocarbons, that are compounds containing carbon and hydrogen only. And in chapter three, we talked about another group of organic compounds called halogenated hydrocarbons. 
Halogenated hydrocarbons are hydrocarbons which one of the hydrogen has been replaced by either a fluorine or a chlorine or a bromine. Today I'm talking with Dr. Ernst, a professor of chemistry at SMS. Dr. Ernst is an analytical chemist and is interested in pesticides in the environment. Dr. Ernst, can you share with us a little bit about the history of pesticides and some of the potential health aspects of those pesticides? Pesticides, especially some of the older pesticides, the ones that tend to give problems, are the chlorinated hydrocarbon pesticides, uh, DDT, Indrin, Heptachlor. These are insect hormone mimics and they disrupt uh, life cycles of insects and kill them. Uh, they were developed because they did a very good job of killing insects. At the time, they were thought to be non-toxic to humans. Uh, they were also used because they are not water soluble and therefore stay around and so that they are available then to control insects over a long period of time. We now know that that's a, a major problem with this class of compounds. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the areas that you have sampled uh, and how you go about collecting your samples for analysis? Well primarily I, the area that I've been looking at is Lake Springfield which is the lake right south of town uh, I'm looking primarily at pesticide levels in the parts of fish that you eat, uh, primarily bass fillets. Uh, this is the type of samples that we have in, that we have analyzed. In order to collect samples, of course, uh, I have been known to do a little fishing in the past, not more than three or four times a week if I could get get out. However, I figured out this is a good way of of doing some quote research and fun at the same time. We actually collect our samples using. Uh, conventional fishing techniques, namely throwing lures or plastic worms, and gather samples in this fashion. Uh, the master student that I had working on this project uh, was rather enthusiastic about sampling uh, for the samples he needed for his research, and so we would spend a number of mornings out on Lake Springfield uh, <clears throat> obtaining some samples. Well, it sounds like you have fun getting your samples. I'm sure that you can probably find a lot of students to uh, uh, assist you in going out collecting your samples. Uh, once you've collected your samples, however, can you explain a little bit how you actually go about determining whether or not there are pesticides in the fish samples? The chlorinated hydrocarbon pesticides are basically a nonpolar molecule, and therefore they are, are much, much more soluble in the fat part of organisms. And so what we do in order to do the, the actual analysis is we take a sample of fish, extract the fish sample with a hydrocarbon which dissolves both the fat and the pesticides. We then take that extract and do what is called a, a cleanup technique to remove some of the, the fat type molecules. And then the resulting sample is concentrated down and then analyzed by gas chromatography. Bob, it sounds like it's not really a simple uh, method for determining the presence of pesticides uh, in the samples that you do collect. Can you share with us a little bit some of the results that you did find of some of the fish that you analyzed in this area? We have looked primarily at uh, bass fillets and one catfish fillet out of Lake Springfield. The maximum level of pesticides we found was about 17 parts per billion. The area at which they become concerned about whether or not you can eat the fish is, is above a part per million. And so we're about a fifth to a tenth that level at, at our highest sample size. And so the fish in Lake Springfield are perfectly safe to eat. Bob, I want to thank you for taking time today to come in and talk with us and share with my Chemistry 105 students and myself some of the information that you have relative to pesticides in uh, the aquatic system and a little bit about your findings on some of the local fish uh, that I might someday partake of myself. Thank you very much.